What's up, friends? Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, creators, and marketers to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform business models and create thriving communities. Enjoy this next episode. GM, GM, what's up, Web3 Academy? What's up, Web3 Doers? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening in today. Hope you're having a lovely, lovely day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Uh, hope you're smiling. Hope you're enjoying being alive. What a day. What a life. All is well. Um, today, we're going to chat about member experience. Is member experience the new user experience in Web3? We talk a lot about user experience and UX and the problems that Web3 is facing when it comes to UX, uh, so much so that initially the big issue that we had and that I think a lot of us foresaw in Web3 was the scalability of blockchain being the big issue. But we've we've pretty much solved that. We've got you know great innovation happening in the blockchain space that scalability is not really the issue anymore. Uh, UX is really the issue that we need to solve Uh, And and why do we need to solve it? Well, because we want to onboard the world, billions of people. We want to onboard 7.7 billion people to Web3. And why do we want to set onboard 7.7 billion people to Web3? Well, because we believe that Web3 makes the world a better place. We believe that digital ownership is a amazing thing for most of the world. We believe that the power of Web3 to impact lives through the decentralized, permissionless, immutable manner in which the blockchain operates is something that will make human lives better. And so we spend our time building. Uh, And if you're a builder, if you are out there building in Web3, uh, whether you're tech or non-tech, whether you're working at a Web3 startup, or whether you're trying to transition your current Web2 business into Web3, we all need to think about UX because UX is the biggest challenge that we have that's going to stop people from engaging. It's going to stop users from signing up for your tool, from using your protocol. Uh, So it's the biggest challenge that we've got. So how are we going to fix that? Well, today we're going to talk about that. But before we do, just want to make a quick plug for the Web3 Academy Doers Talent Board. Uh, We've got almost 50 Web3 uh, professionals looking for jobs right now on our talent board. So if you are hiring, if you're a company that is hiring in Web3, We want you to come and hang out and chat to our members. Uh, These people are, I mean, there's a whole variety of skill sets that they have and experience that they have. We've got uh, product managers. uh, We've got former CEOs. We've got, you know, junior product managers, senior project product managers. We've got brand partnership and biz dev professionals. Uh, We've got employee branding. Uh, We've got growth, biz dev, I already mentioned that. Um, We've got uh, product designers, people who understand UI and UX. Gosh, we we know we need more of them. We've got community managers, social media managers. Uh, So we've got just an incredible variety of talent here in the Web3 Collective. And the way the Web3 Collective works, the Web3 Academy Collective works is these people post profiles on the talent collective website. And then you, the recruiter, the hiring manager can come in and speak directly to them. You can read their profiles and then you can request to chat with them, giving you much more of an opportunity to connect with them one-on-one and to do so in a place where you know that these people all have the passion for Web3. They have the values base that you have and that we all have. And so their foundation is is exactly what you're looking for. And plus, I'm telling you, the skills off the chart, incredible skills. So if you are hiring, please check out in the show notes. There will be a link 
to check out the Web3 Collective where you can find your next hire. Okay, so for today's episode, I am going to read a article from one of our members, our member Tom Vanden Duren. A shout out to Tom, a great writer and researcher with a lot of experience. Uh, and he has written an article called Member Experience is the New User Experience in Web3. And I'm going to read that article to you with a little bit of uh, my own um, opinions and thoughts added in. Uh, before I get into it, if you don't follow Tom, highly recommend check out the show notes, link to his stuff. It's going to be there. He's an awesome guy that's really thinking uh, and bringing in thought leadership into the Web3 space. Okay, let's start. The user experience problem. In terms of user experience, Web3 faces loads of basic access and usability challenges before it can cross the chasm to onboard the masses. Many of the early apps and services are built with a developer mindset while the overall user experience is still fraught with friction and frustration. Without wanting to state the obvious, Web3 design needs to put the user at the center to deliver useful, usable, and enjoyable user experiences. Web3 starts from a high bar with an addressable user base that is well-versed in tech and familiar familiarized to the rich interfaces and convenience of Web2 apps and services. As user expectations for digital services have steadily grown, people will get easily frustrated by confusing Web3 journeys and slow speeds. The good news is that UX has become a core priority within the Web3 ecosystem, with many experienced and skilled Web2 designers taking the plunge to fix the basics. At least this means there will be less tendency to reinvent the wheel, but rather stick with familiar and tested design and UI paradigms. So let's talk, what, what are those design fundamentals that improve UX? The list of design priorities to tackle is not a small one. However, none of the below challenges are super complex and can be resolved with sound application of design fundamentals. So what are these design fundamentals? First, useful. Second, accessible. Third, usable. Fourth, trustworthy. Fifth, enjoyable and six, valuable. Now you might be wondering, okay, well, what, is, what do those things mean in terms of design? So let's just talk about each one of them. First, useful. Useful is what's in it for me. You need to ensure that users get what value your Web3 app, service, or community will add to their lives. You need to emphasize benefits over features. Accessible. You need ease of access and onboarding. You need to remove barriers to entry. For example, don't force wallet access. I think that's a big question right now is, you know, should you force wallet access? At what point in the user journey do you force wallet access? A lot of users do not have wallets. Only about 80 million Ethereum wallets are currently in, in use. It's only 80 million people. So if you force wallet access, you're eliminating the potential of anybody else using your product, your service, your app. Thankfully, there's many tools being built uh, that don't force wallet access that allow you to sign up with email, which is what a lot of people are doing right now, using Web2 in order to onboard people to Web3. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with using email as a way to sign up, as to bring people into your audience, and then train them on how to have a wallet, how to use a wallet before forcing the access. You need to create a welcoming and engaging onboarding experience, and you need to provide how-to tutorials. I think this is so key is because this is something new, people have fear. People do not like change. We do not like new. Most of us do not like new. So when we show up somewhere new, whether it be the physical world or the digital world, we want to be slowly walked and guided step-by-step step into that new product, that new app, that new community. And it is our job as leaders in the Web3 space to provide that onboarding experience. And the best way to do that is how-to tutorials on products like Scribe, 
or video tutorials that walk somebody through step-by-step -step what to do. Usable. This is ease of use and interaction. We need to trim down or avoid using Web3 lingo and use familiar language and terms instead. Hide the complexity of the blockchain backend while being transparent about what data and transactions live on the blockchain. So it's not to say we can't have the Web3 culture. We can say GM. We can call people our friends. But maybe we don't do it in the onboarding. Maybe we don't do it right when somebody new who might not be from Web3 comes to our service. We need to think about the member experience, the journey that they take, and where are they in their journey, and re meet them there. We need to relate and meet to our members at that point. Trustworthy, clarity and fairness of terms and permissions. Take down the FUD, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And build trust through full transparency. Data provenance, transactions, smart contracts, user permissions. Treat data ownership and portability as a first-class citizen. Thankfully, this is in the ethos of Web3. But I think we need to train our members and our users about why we believe blockchain is more trustworthy. Because they don't understand blockchain. They don't know that blockchain is more trustworthy. So we need to train them. We need to educate them on that. Enjoyable, elegance and richness of user interface. Apply the rich UI design principles Web2 users have grown to be accustomed to. Provide and ask for the right amount of information at the right time. I think this is, is so key. And this is the big challenge that you have when you're building new digital products is taking the time to build great UI and great design is not always possible. But I think that this is, and we all know this is so vital in order to onboard the masses to Web3. And we're already seeing great improvements with UI. I, I feel like every new product, every new tool that comes out, every new wallet that comes out, there's better UI. There's better experience. Finally, we need to make it valuable effectiveness in delivering user value. We need to optimize for value creation, capture, and distribution, recognize and reward user contributions, eliminate gas fees. This is a big one. And we were just chatting with Lens Protocol the other day, which is building the social graph for the new Web3 social media layer. And they currently are covering the gas fees as are a lot of the apps building on top of Lens Protocol. Now it's up to the app and you need to decide if you're building in Web3, should you be covering the gas fees? You know, If you're building an NFT project and you're targeting NFT collectors who are already buying lots of NFTs, that's not a big deal. They're not so concerned about the gas fees. But if you're trying to onboard somebody new, then gas fees is a big deal. That can be the difference between them buying and then not buying. So you really should think about absorbing the gas fees in the beginning, at least until scaling solutions have brought down the cost to be to much more manageable levels, which is coming very quickly right now. None of the above, above fundamentals are, are Web3 specific, maybe with the exception of a higher emphasis on designing for trust and transparently aligning to the core Web3 ethos principles, uh, principles and implications of decentralization, trustlessness, immutability, uncensorability, and ownership. However, as success for many of the Web3 applications will rely on building and engaging a thriving community, I would argue that designing with the member in mind will elevate Web3 design into its own field of expertise and excellence. And this is the point that Tom is making that I just love. He is saying that we are going to see a transformation of the user experience field. User experience is not a new area. Uh, you know, People have been designing for user experience for ever since we were making products, ever since Ford made, Henry Ford made the first uh, car. Everyone's been thinking about user experience. But with Web3, Tom is saying that we are transforming and transitioning into an opportunity to start to think about member experience. Okay, so what does that mean? What is member experience? 
Optimizing for member experience refocuses the design challenge on creating a shared digital space for people to do things together. Relational design aims to optimize for peer-to-peer connections and community co-creation, facilitating relational processes that collectively build and distribute agency. I just want to highlight two things there. Member experience is all about peer-to-peer connection and community co-creation. Incredibly powerful things that are difficult to create. Not everybody can create a community or a product where there's peer-to-peer connection and community co-creation. But if you can, the results are 100 times what you could create on your own. They move the needle way faster when you can create community co-creation and peer-to-peer connection. It filters all UX elements, usefulness, accessibility, usability through a community lens and rewires traditional single user incentives and two-way relationships into many-to-many value creation dynamics. It starts with understanding members' motives and mapping their experience and touch points on a member journey map. We've all heard about user experience maps, customer journey maps. Well, this is a member journey map. Members' motives for joining communities are often driven both by a sense of self-interest and a desire for connecting with like-minded individuals. Most vibrant communities will be those that optimize on both axes, allowing members to self-identify and indulge in a range of member-only benefits and perks while creating a space for like-minded fans to socialize and co-create. When designing for member experience and creating the member journey map, it's important to consider both the me and the we perspective of any member interacting with your community. A member journey map is a visual representation of every experience members will have with a particular Web3 community. It helps to tell the story of a member's experience with a community from initial onboarding through to long-term commitment. I love this concept of a member journey map. I think it is so powerful to consider how you can take your members through a journey to becoming a community member, not to becoming often customer journey maps. The objective, you're taking them through to becoming a customer, right? You, everything is, it's a funnel, you know, step-by-step until you convert to purchase, right? Member, it's a different model you're trying to convert them into a member, which is, remember, what does a member mean? We go back, it means peer-to-peer connection, and it means community co-creation. How do you take a member on a journey to get them there? Let's talk about that. The three-stage funnel. You can think of a community membership journey as a three-stage funnel that takes a potential member from the community discovery stage to sustained positive sum participation. In building this funnel, Web3 designers and community builders should aim to optimize for the following. Number one, community discovery and onboarding. Number two, member activation and contributions. Number three, community ownership and governance. So let's just talk about each one of those three for a second. Number one was community discovery and onboarding. So this is top of funnel awareness to attract potential community members and contributors. Member onboarding, with focus on shared expectation setting and initial relationship building. You know, this is when you enter a new Web3 Discord. What's what's that process like? Is it welcoming? Do you feel comfortable? Do you post once and then leave? We as member experience thinkers need to welcome people in our community and onboard them in a way that creates relationship building. So one of the best ways that I've seen this done is in the jump community. In jump, initially for the first year about, the founder, Jeff Kaufman, met with every single new member in the community. So there was a one-on-one meeting. He did over 700 meetings in a year. Now that's not scalable. And Certainly, we understand that there's there's a limit to that type of thing. But here's the thing. When it comes to building community, when it comes to member experience, you have to do the non-scalable things first. 
if you really want to build an engaged community. If you're just looking to sell an NFT, sure, get as many people into your Discord as possible, try to sell it to them. But I'll tell you what, you're not building a community. Those people are all going to try to flip that NFT. They're in it for the financial gain. They're not in it for your values. They're not in it for community co-creation. They're not in it to build alongside you, which is the power of building community. Another great tip I've seen from a Web3 community is Safari DAO. Shout out to Safari. Awesome community all around building how to build growth, the growth playbook in Web3. And what they do is when you join their community, you, you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So they took after jump and did that same thing. But then you also have a introduction to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with another community member. What a powerful tactic introducing, because that's what you want. You want that cross-pollination within your community. So by introducing to a, creating a introduction with another community member and those community members meeting up, you're creating an atmosphere and a culture where it says it's normal in our community for you to reach out to each other and for you to connect. And that's what you need. You need that. Another big thing around onboarding and the initial process to get in, and this is another good question is, should you have to apply to join a community? And I've heard both, both sides put out well. But I think that the key thing you need to understand is if you are building and building for the long term, then you need to build alongside people who value what you're doing and want to be part of what you're doing. And you don't need 100,000 people to do that. You know, you don't need, there's a difference between a community and an audience. Audience, yes, you're, you're looking large. You're trying to get hundreds of thousands of followers on your Twitter, on your YouTube, on your lens, you know, the new Web3 social. You're trying to get a big audience. Your email list should be large. You're, you're aiming for, for quantity there, right? But when it comes to your community, when it comes to your member experience, you don't need big quantity. So you need to do the things initially that ensure you get the members that value you the most because they're the ones that are going to go tell everybody else about your community. They're, they're your marketers. They're your boots on the ground. They're your ambassadors. And so the idea of having an application to join a Web3 tool or Web3 product, if you want to be part of that community, an application makes a lot of sense to me. I see that as a good thing. Number two, member activation and contribution. You need to create ways for people to get involved meaningfully. You need to surface roles, projects, and opportunities for members to contribute, creating a positive feedback cycle, social recognition and reputation, monetary token rewards. I think this is so important. Quite simply, if you show up to a new community or a new product, and there is a simple way for you to get meaningfully involved, to, to do something that brings you, that feels like you are helping the mission and vision of that project, the amount of commitment that you'll have to that project enhances significantly. So try to think about ways to activate your members, to get them to contribute in simple ways. There needs to be layers. You can't go the hardest thing right away. It needs to be simple. Ways for them to participate are so important. Number three, community ownership and governance. I mean, we all know this is the big unlock of Web3 is you now have the opportunity to empower your members to have real impact on the future direction of the community, of the product by facilitating proposals and voting. There's huge opportunity here. A great example of this. One of the best examples of this is NounsDAO. NounsDAO, even if you're not in NounsDAO, uh, because it costs like 100 ETH to buy a noun, I certainly don't have 100 ETH, but go check out NounsDAO online and check out their prop house. It's where all of their proposals go to. And you can see the what's happening in NounsDAO. Now, you can also yourself you can, even if you're not a NounsDAO member, you can make a proposal to NounsDAO to get funding for something so long as you are supporting NounsDAO. So you've, you've got to use the Web3 unlock of ownership and governance, governance being the big one, 
get your members involved, enable them to be part of the future direction of your product and try to do it in simple ways too. Like the, another example of a great, a great way I've seen this done is by a GameFi company that started a DAO where anybody can test and play games and give feedback. So, and I believe they have over 2000 guild members in that part of the DAO game testers, right? You know, simple. It's not, these people don't need to make complex proposals of the future direction. There's only ever going to be so many people that want to work on your product, but giving feedback, people love to give feedback. So you got to go find simple ways for them to take that ownership and to feel involved in the governance in the direction of, of what you're building. In mapping the member journey across these stages, it's recommended to first optimize for contributor and creator member personas. Communities thrive because of their contributors. In order to build your initial minimum viable community, focus your efforts selectively on those who want to get involved meaningly, meaningfully and are likely to be your early adapters. Identify and engage individuals who will be top contributors and super fans, those that share your community's vision and buy into your purpose. By attracting primarily intrinsically motivated community members aligned to the community's ethos and mission, as opposed to purely extrinsically motivated participants driven by external incentives, financial gain or short-term self-gain, you will be able to use this core team to build and validate your minimum viable community and gradually go grow your community by weaving from the inside out. This also is so true. And quite simply put, you only need 100 committed community members to really build something. If you have 100 people that are active and engaged and contributing to your community, your community will soar. That's all you need in the beginning. So focus on those. Optimize for the contributors in the beginning because that's what you need. You don't need, you get... If you got a thousand or even 10,000 people who are passive versus 100 who are active and are contributing, you, you would definitely always want those 100 contributors. Think of this like an ambassador program where your early adapters will become a de facto community leaders by modeling the behavior you want in the community. People only contribute to communities if they trust that their time and energy are going to be put to good use. Trust starts with mutuality and builds with agency. Mutuality means members will need to trust that the intentions behind the community are earnest and that other members in the community share the same values as they do. Agency and positive feedback cycles will build trust that member contributions are going to be put to good use and that the community is capable of making progress on and achieving its goals. Unique community members. In designing for member experience, it's also important to not treat all members equally. Beyond the core team and active contributors, there is likely to be a majority of more passive members as well. I think this is a great point that Tom is making here. You've got core team, you've got active contributors, and then you've got passive members. So think about when you're designing your member experience map, journey map, you think about those three differently because they are three distinct groups. Even if the role is lighter and less persistent, it's important to think about minimum requirements or expectations any community member would need to live up to in order to ensure good cohesion and vibrancy. Different levels of participation and commitment require different member engagement, feedback, and reward me mechanisms. That means MX, member experience design, will ultimately result in a layered experience with a mix of one-to-one -one personalized engagement, collective open to all community interaction, and a range of more topical channels, discussion forums, and project groups. And with some of these spaces only accessible to select members, gating access based on member profiles, roles, reputation, and or wallets. One thing that I wanna say here is I believe that if in the beginning, you focus on your contributors, as Tom mentioned. And if in the beginning, you don't focus on scale, but focus on quality, 
then what that will lead to is it will lead to a completely open community in the beginning. I don't think you need to gate access to select members in the beginning. I think in the beginning, you should have everything open and you should build in public. Because when you do that, your members have a chance to contribute. They see what's going on. And those that want to be involved will raise their hand and will jump in where there is the opportunity. So build in public in the beginning. Over time, yes, you do need to have access gating to different areas within your community, within your membership. And that's a result of reward. That's how you incentivize them, right? Oh, if you're at this level of, of a membership, you're this involved, then you deserve more access, all right? And that's the beauty of Web3 is you can do that all through tokens and through various Web3 tools and tactics. Okay, identity and reputation. Member identity and reputation will need to be architected with this multi-layered experience in mind. Identity is how we view ourselves. Reputation is how we view other, how others view us. Most Web3 apps and communities work with so, so, pseudonymous, I always struggle with that word, pseudonymous identities, allowing members to identify themselves with a virtual and often community-specific profile. Some communities rely on NFTs as a unique profile identifier, PFP. Some allow members to transfer their identity and PFP over from other communities. However, and more importantly, identity design should allow members to reflect relevant skills, verifiable credentials, affinities, and relationships to facilitate peer-level member interactions and drive collective agency. All this without compromising member privacy and control over what data they share. I think this is huge. And this is, this is the future that we haven't quite seen yet. Is this identity and reputation part of Web3 is still in its infancy. And there's a lot of people working on it. There's people working on Proof, proof of Humanity is a great project that's trying to work on identity as one human one online presence, right? We have a lot of scammers. We have a lot of issues with bots. You know, can we eliminate that with something like Proof of Humanity? Incredible project. You also have projects like Disco, uh, you have projects like Meta Intro. These projects are looking to focus on the verifiable credentials, the, the education that you have, the work that you have. Can we bring that on chain to show through your identity who you are and what you carry in your backpack, basically. You know, uh, nobody knows that you have a degree from some school or that you have some certification, unless maybe you have it on your LinkedIn or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's up in your office, but we're all living in the digital world now, anyways. So, how do we know these things? Well, that needs to be put, become part of our identity. And once Web3 allows that to become part of our identity in communities and with our members, we need to allow them to show that off. We need to allow them to make that, to show that to other members because that's what creates networking. That's what creates an opportunity for, oh, you're, you're similar to me. I want to meet you. Let's, let's get together and let's build this community even further. Beyond identity, designing an effective community reputation model will be critical. Reputation incentives and feedback loops are crucial to the growth, success, and sustainability of any Web3 project or community. Reputation systems enable communities to recognize and reward members' contributions, including content creation, moderation, community building, and specific project work. They provide the foundation for social signaling and proof of skin to enable and gamify a community-specific status play. The earned reputation should be non-transferable and non-permanent, but can be linked to fungible and redeemable awards. You deserve badges, right? Like if you, your reputation, if you do something in a community, if you do something for a product, if you're part of giving feedback, then you should get a badge for that, right? It, POAP is the best example of this, although POAP is proof of attendance, but it's the same idea. You can think about it like, okay, I'm in a community and 
I was at a basketball game last year. And at that basketball game, you know, because I was at that basketball game, I had that ticket and I saw the Toronto Raptors play. Well, wouldn't it be cool if in that community there was a badge that was shown to somebody else? Oh, you also were at that Toronto Raptors game? Oh, you must be a Raptors fan. Oh, we have something in common. Oh, I, I've attended Burning Man a few times. Burning Man is a pretty niche festival, arts festival. It happens in Nevada every year. And wow, wouldn't it be amazing if in a community I could see somebody else who also attended Burning Man? What a connection that would make, right? Those are the types of things that proof of POAP, proof of attendance protocol is going to allow because you're going to get badges for attending events, for attending things. Well, we need to extend that beyond POAP. We need to extend that to many of the things that we do that we can take on chain and share with our community members and build a reputation as a result of that, which then encourages peer-to-peer -peer connection and leads to co-creation, building together as a community. Community management, big topic here. Delivering a layered experience based on a member's identity and reputation implies that the role of community managers will become more important than ever. They will be the driver of community engagement, moderation, and activation, while at the same time being a role model reflecting and embodying the community's norms, values, and desired behavioral traits. In addition to facilitating member-to-member -member relationship building and interaction, community managers need to proactively activate the member and community feedback loop to create a sense of collective governance and co-ownership. All this means that back-end community management tools will be equally crucial to member-facing features in optimizing for the overall member experience. Obviously, member profiling, access and permission management, reputation reward systems will all need to be catered for. I cannot wait for the community management tools that are going to come into Web3. Now, if you are building a community management tool, please reach out to me. I want to talk to you. I want to learn about what you're building and I want to help you because this is a huge space that we need a lot of help in. Uh, no offense to Discord. Thank you, Discord, for bringing us all together and giving us all a place to hang out in Web3. But man, the MX in Discord is not the greatest. It was not built for these communities that we are now building. It is not built for great MX. So we need something better. Tools for member onboarding and relationship management, as well as all member notifications and subgroup communications will be essential to activate and sustain the community flywheel. And content moderation tools will help curate and filter valuable member contributions. I can't wait for somebody to create a content. If anybody knows of a bot that you can use in Discord to schedule Discord messages, that would be awesome. I would really enjoy that. Please DM that to me. Thank you. Tokenization adds even more requirements to the community manager's toolbox, from token creation and distribution to tokenomics and treasury management. Finally, KPIs and analytics will need to be will need to provide crucial insights into a community's overall health, effectiveness, and vibrancy. On the note of tokenization, I just want to touch on that for a second because I think this is an important thing around member experience. Uh, when you consider when token for your community, I think that what's important is that you do not need to start with a token. I think a lot of communities, you know, the great line that I heard is, you know, token communities build tokens, tokens don't build communities right? So you need to build your community first before adding a token. The one suggestion I would have, the one way that I can see using a token early on is just as a form of gratitude or tipping. You're basically gamifying emojis in your community. Wouldn't that be fun? Isn't that cool? You know, everybody loves emojis in communities. Everybody's firing them all, all the time, sharing emojis on each other's posts. Well, imagine if every time there was an emoji on your post, you got one token from that community. Now that token doesn't have any liquidity. It has no financial value. It's just for fun. But man, doesn't that make it fun? You get, you get some form of recognition, your reputation. We talked about reputation before. You get reputation. People can start to see. Basically, this is what Reddit has already done, 
right? And we're just bringing this into Web3. Now, eventually, you might decide to do more with that token. You might give it utility. You might give it liquidity. But in the beginning, I do not think that should be the focus when you are creating community or building your member experience. In the beginning, your experience should be focused on fun and engagement. Unless, unless, unless you are building something that you are requiring builders to come in and build your product. If they're building your product, then you should be compensating them for that, in which case tokenomics and a token with liquidity and with financial value makes sense because these people need to have compensation in return for their work, right? So if you're doing that, then tokenomics makes sense. But if you're talking about the community members that are involved as more the passive or the contributors, but they're not the builders, they're not the core team, then I think that in the beginning, you start with a fun token, you start with a gratitude, you start with a tipping token, and then you go from there. In managing a community and optimizing for individual and collective member experience, predictability and repeatability will be key. I love this quote. Listen to this quote. Repeatability creates rhythm. Rhythm creates traction. Traction leads to flywheels. Flywheels lead to growth. Great communities thrive on repeatability, a rhythm that feels natural, rituals that happen regularly, consistent and recurring formats, a culture and value, a culture and values that are embodied. And this is a great point and really simple too. Like be repetitive. It's important in branding, it's important in marketing, and it's also important in community, right? If you start with repetitiveness, like you have an event at the exact same time every week, right? People put it in their calendar. They get used to it. They show up. That repetitiveness, that creates rhythm, right? They get into the rhythm of being a part of your community. And that creates traction. Traction leads to flywheels. Flywheels lead to growth. So you can see how starting with something simple that's repetitive is a really powerful tactic in the beginning to lead to the growth, the end result that you're looking for of growth. Okay, in conclusion, there's still a lot of basics to fix regarding overall Web3 user experience, but it's by focusing on member experience, MX design, and applying a many-to-many -many lens that Web3 apps and communities will create a repeatable flywheel and forcible muscle to deliver on the promise of Web3's ownership economy. Now, Tom says, I'm not a design expert, but welcome the UX and design ecosystems to start thinking about the unique challenges and opportunities of designing for Web3 experiences by combining the best of Web2 with the distinctive community and membership aspects of Web3. Shout out Tom. Tom Vanden Duren, thank you for that incredible article. Thank you for sharing that with the Web3 community. If you're listening to this podcast and you want to talk more about community or you want to join an awesome community, hop into our Discord. Uh, we do have an application to get into our Discord because as I said before, we are not focused on quantity. We are focused on quality. We are looking for people that want to educate the masses on Web3. That is our mission at Web3 Academy. We are here to onboard millions into Web3. And we're also here to help businesses transform their business into a web three business. We're help, here to help you build your community. We're here to help you use, think about MX design. How can member, member experience design be used in your business? Those are the questions that we're answering in the web three Academy discord. If you're not already there, please join us. Link will be in the show notes. And one last time, if you're still listening, thanks for still listening. You're awesome. Give yourself a pat in the back. And if you are hiring, please check out the Web3 Academy Collective. We've got 50 talented people in there right now and more people joining every day. We just started this a few weeks ago, and it's already full of some incredible talent that are looking for jobs in Web3. So if you're hiring, hop over to our collective and find your next hire. Have a fantastic day, everybody. I'm Jay Hamilton, and I'll see you next time. 
Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, you want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.